So this week we're looking at chapter one, which is about, um, well, it's called uh, exploratory data analysis, right? I didn't get that wrong. Um, but it's a kind of about like basics of um, data analysis. Um, and so we'll be talking about classifying data as numerical or categorical, um, or at least that's a, a thing that we're supposed to have learned. Uh, we want to compare and contrast estimates of location, compare and contrast estimates of variability, um, visualize our data distributions, visualize categorical data, and use correlation coefficients to measure association between two variables, and then visualize data distributions in two dimensions. Um, before we get started, does anyone have any just kind of overall thoughts on uh, the size of the chapter, the what it what it covered, anything like that, or shall we dive right in? Let me get the chat open. Where are you, chat? That's weird. Okay. Yeah, I I didn't think that it was a big enough chapter, like you had. Um, warned earlier. Yeah, like um, they're very wordy, and yeah. I don't, I don't really mind it, but it looked like it was more information than it ended up actually being. I felt like. Mm -hmm. um, I think later chapters will probably be more so. This is kind of the introductory stuff, but I thought it was going to have a lot more in it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean. Con context wise it was like okay yeah i mean we do those things so yeah um yeah but there are i think there are some um you know some bits to pull out and i'm sure you know everyone has different experience levels so um you know this may or may not have been new for people yeah. all right let's go ahead and dive in um so they talk about structured data uh that you have numeric data and categorical data, and you can subdivide those numeric into like continuous or discrete, uh, categorical, binary, or ordinal, or really neither binary nor ordinal. And then the the like frame of reference for data science and a lot of things is uh, rectangular data. We call it data frames in R or tibbles or data tables. Um, rows in tidy data data are records or observations or cases or instances and columns or features or variables or attributes or sometimes predictors, sometimes outcomes. And I think that the, like the main takeaway from this beginning part is that there's lots of names for everything in both stats and data science. That is a whole thing that, um, you know, statisticians will say that a data scientist is a statistician who uses different words. Um, because that's a lot of times what has happened, like the computer science side came in and gave new terms to things that already had names. Um, but yeah, that, so that was the basic idea there. Again, if you've worked in R at all, you've probably worked with data frames um, and a little bit with the types. All right. Um, then they have this the section on the estimates of location. Um, so, you know, we've probably all worked with the mean, like, you know, that goes back to, um, you know, grade school, you start learning about averages. Uh, but I, I do like, you know, thinking about the trimmed mean, like I often jump to the median when I want something that's less susceptible to outliers, um, but trimmed mean is also useful. So it was nice to bring in. Um, they also talk about weighted means where you might want to downweight things that are, um, you know, like if you have a bad sensor, you don't want to take that one into account as much. Or if you have something that you know is there more, but it's underrepresented, like um, when you're doing polling data, for example, you might upweight something. Um, personally, I, I work with, um, like educational data. And so just waiting, you know, an exam is an example of a weighted mean that they didn't bring in here. Um, where you might have, you know, one question is worth 10 points and other questions worth two points. Um, all right, any questions about the basics or the, the mean stuff yeah. or any comments? Yeah. Go for it. 
Um, so um, my question goes to this weighted mean. Um, so how do we um, um, provide weight uh, if we want to calculate the weighted mean? Is it random that we select just, I don't know? Um, I mean, it depends on the situation, I think. Like I just, <laughs> I chose values that made something uh, nice and pretty, but um, you know, normally it might be, for example, we know that there are five categories and um, you know, maybe this third category is, um, this, this is a bad example, but let's say, you know, we might do it by like um, what we expect the actual uh, number of people to be in the, in the whole population or the, the percentage of the, the whole population. We would use that for our different groups, maybe to weight things up and down. Um, like, so this one person actually is representing 11 people. It's basically what's happening here. This one, whatever, this one observation. Um, but I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole thing, deciding how to weight things. Um, that's, you know, that's what, uh, like political surveys are all about deciding how to weight things. And that's where you get random or very different um, outcomes sometimes from basically the same survey. Does anyone have any other thoughts on how to how to decide to weigh weigh things? Well, we use we look at clinical trials, and if clinical trial enrollment, like say for example, you had one with a couple of thousand participants and another that only had maybe two hundred, we would would we weigh? Well, we do try to get like pooled estimates that are then adjusted by the gotcha. enrollment, and that would be weighing those means for whatever the sense. measurement would be. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Did that, did that answer it? Do you get the idea? Yeah, At sure. Least? Yeah. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, yeah, it's all, it's going to be very situation dependent. Um, all right. So then in the median, um, you know, like I said, I, I often go to median, like I work a lot with, um, uh, for example, uh, time on task data, where sometimes someone takes, you know, 40 days on something and everyone else takes two minutes. Well, that 40 day person, I don't want to be factored into my data set. Um, and so the median is, you just sort them in order and take the value that's in the middle. Um, yeah. Like, um, yep. Go another ahead. basic question. Um. So what <laughs> what determines why um when to use mean, uh, when to use median? Um. I so I personally go for the median anytime I know there are going to be outliers and I don't want them. You know, I don't particularly care about the outliers. I want to look at the more the tendency of the normal. Or the the average the typical um, observation. So when John, do you mind um, zooming in on your presentation? Oh, no problem. Um, in theory, <laughs> if it's possible, it is possible. I'm going to have to reshare. I think, though. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. That's absolutely fine. I meant to do this. So, thank you. Let's uh, let's do this right. Um, which one is the right one? Let's see. Let's close the wrong one so I don't accidentally reshare it. There. Oops. Thank you. You're welcome. I meant to do that, so <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, all right, so let me get the chat reopen. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's just, you know, it depends, again, it's context dependent. It depends what you're trying to see in the data. Um, a lot of times I'll look at both, and if they're really different, make sure you understand why, um, especially in a large data set. 
they'll usually be somewhat similar if you don't have a ton of outliers. Um, but if you do have a ton of outliers, especially in one direction, that might throw the median or the mean far away from the median. All right. Um, weighted median, uh, I thought was interesting. I, I got, I went down a rabbit hole because they kind of go into exactly what it means. But if you look at like how it's being calculated, um, you know, like, okay, I'm going to take the weighted median of this data set using that same set of weights. Um, and I get 1.33333. And I was like, wait, where did, where did that come from exactly? Um, what it's doing is by default, it's in, in R, it's interpolating values like in between the values that you're given. And so 1.3333 is the interpolated median. Um, but if we tell it that we don't want to interpolate, then the weighted median becomes a lot easier to understand. Um, it became, it's basically equivalent to just repeating by the weights. So I had weight of one on all of these weight of 11 on this one. So it becomes the median. Um, and it, it was really interesting to kind of dig into the code that it's uh, it's something that sounds like it's simple. Just, oh, it's a weighted median, but it's a there's a lot more that goes into actually estimating it. So. All right, let's move, oops, yeah, move on. Um, so then we went into uh, estimates of variability or dispersion, how clustered is the data? Um, first, they talk about standard deviation and variance. Um, the variance is the average of the squared deviations or the average of the squared uh, difference from the mean. Um, and then the standard deviation is the square root of that. Um, the reason that you want to take that square root is it puts it back into like the same scale as the data itself. Um, and you know, I just ran it to, to verify that it is calculating out as exactly the square root of the standard deviation, I mean, of the variance. Um, and then there's the median absolute deviation from the median or the MAD, um, which is the same kind of thing, but it's robust to outliers like the median is. Um, by default, R uh, scales it, like they talk in the book a little bit about there being the scaling factor you can do for MAD to make it be on the same scale as like standard deviation. And I confused myself because this, the uh, scaling factor is 1.4826. And I was like, wait, why Why did I randomly end up with the scaling factor? But it's because the median um, absolute deviation from the median in my data set, if we look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, it's like they are, they're all a deviation of one except for 10. And so um, the one times the scale factor is the scale factor. I think I'm right about why that came out that way. Um, if anyone wants to check my math on that. John, is it useful to talk here about the scale factor? I mean, it might, it kind of feels like this like magical number. <laughs> An arbitrary right? number. Yeah. Um, so I wanna, let's, let's do this. Um, I'm gonna switch my sharing again Oops. over to my, our session. So they do talk a little bit in here about um, the scale factor. Uh, I mean, a little bit. A little bit. It, to me, it still is kind of magic. Um, does anyone have any like background on like why it's this number? I mean, I can kind of follow along there, but um, does that have something to do with like what a normal distribution? 
um, of something, something, I don't know, like, because it's a default, but. It, yeah. I, I think it is something, something normal distribution, but I don't know. Is, uh, does Scott have an answer or anyone else, but I'm going to try to use Scott since you're evaluating this for possibly teaching it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember here. I, I think you're on the right track. It has to do is if the data were normally distributed, you know, that, so if you think about it, if the normally, if the data were normally distributed and. <sighs> I'm going to rescue. I'm going to have to find it. I'm going to rescue you, you a little bit because they do have the note in the book that yeah. it's, it's, um, it is the value such that 50% of a normal distribution fall oh. within plus or minus mad um and then where that number exactly comes from is that uh so if you took a just any normal distribution you probably could calculate that 1.4826 um by like manually finding uh the mad and the data that is within 50 percent or plus or minus one mad and then doing that um, but I like that our um, by default has this constant value in the MAD that is just the magic number that you don't necessarily have to remember. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering if this is the same thing as uh, what we see in a, in a box plot usually. So there we are. Then... Yeah. This number looks familiar for me from, from box plots. I can't remember. In one of the helps, they talk about it. Um, that's uh, the one you're thinking of, right? Yeah, that is the... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Or one Magic numbers numbers everywhere. Yeah. So it, it is. Um, oh, it, actually, isn't the base box plot? different than the ggplot2 box plot and maybe it uses um, I can't find it um, it could be there it's 1.4826 versus 1.5 I could see that being the slight difference between base and um, yeah I threw a link in the chat that that explains where the 1.4826 comes from. Oh, thank you. Um, I will put that link into our our notes about this. Now, you know, one of these, it, it's one of those things that it's nice to have read once, probably, and then you just have to kind of remember that it exists and how it works, what it, you know, why it's useful. Um, in my mind, at least. But yeah, okay, yeah, that that calculation of k is in the help for MAD in um, uh, uh, in R in the R documentation. All right, Oops. let's switch back. Okay. Oops, that's not where I am. All right. So after that, one oh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I saw you and then forgot. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> this is also another dumb question. So um, no such thing. you talk about estimate of um, op uh, variability and um, they basically measure with the data values uh, tightly clustered or spread out. So why do we care to find whether our data is clustered or spread out? Um, what does that make sense if our data is clustered or spread uh, it's clustered and uh, what does this tell us um I, again i it's in context a little bit that it can tell you how much an outlier is an outlier like if it's if your biggest quote unquote outlier is two standard deviations away from the mean then it's not really that different from the mean but if it's 20 standard deviations away from the mean or, or like five, like what, six, if it's six standard deviations away from the mean, it's um, it's a big difference. Um, 
and then it, I don't know, it depends on all kinds of different situations. Like if you're trying to estimate, um, you know, a lot of things, if you're trying to predict something and your window is really small, then okay. Like you can be confident that, okay, my prediction is, you know, it's always going to be within a very tight value. Um, let's say I need it within, I'd like to have it within a minute and my standard deviation is you know, 1.1 minutes and okay, that's, that's not, that's not bad. Um, but if my standard deviation were 30 minutes and I'm trying to get it to the minute, or if my standard deviation were 400 minutes, then basically my data is, you know, it's not telling me anything about how long this thing will take if I'm trying to get it to the minute. Um, I mean, another example, just to kind of give yeah. another context, let's say, let's say you're teaching a class of hundred students and you give an exam and the, the mean score is 50. There's a big mm -hmm. difference between all the students scoring between 49 and 51, like all the students in that narrow range mm -hmm. versus students being all over the board and scoring between 10 and 90 with like a, a mix. So like those two scenarios would have the same mean, but they would still be very different outcomes. And so, you know, the, the spread in your data tells you about those different outcomes. Okay. So it's, it's, right. it's something else you want to know just to understand what happened and you know what, what your data is telling you. Mm. Let me, I'm, I'm going to do, um, uh, I'm going to try to get, to fix a slide here. <laughs> um, can I do this real quick? Let's see. Um, to, to help show you um, the general idea. Let's do... Okay. Actually, it probably with that, okay. <laughs> okay, in theory... Let's see, once this finishes re-rendering, I can pull up an example. It's going to be in the um, probabilities area, but it'll be the same general idea. So, or the percentiles rather. Um, so percentiles are another way to look at this distribution. And do I have the, yes. All right, cool. Um, where it's just like what percent is at or below this value, this percent percentile value. So the you know third percentile is anything that's at or below three. I created a couple of data sets. Um, one that is just uh, take numbers between one and 100, take a hundred of those. And so it's a random selection of those, but it's gonna be roughly evenly distributed throughout. And then I took a norm, made a normal distribution of 100 variables um, centered around 50 with standard deviation of one. I think this will work well. Okay. Um, so first, let's look at a quantile of that first distribution. Um, oh, before I move on, I, I like the uh, Madeline's example that a lot of times, if your distribution is too big, that might be a sign that you just need um, more data um, before you're confident about that estimate. And that is, that's a good point. Um, that, uh, you know, if, if your data is jumping all over the place, you don't have enough data yet to really know what is the mean or what is the median because it's, it's too wide, it's too spread out. Or the other thing that it can mean is that like you're collecting data that isn't tightly related. Like it's there, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, but you know, you're measuring something that isn't really a measurement. It's, it's just a random number generator. So, okay. Um, so yeah, so in the uh, percentiles, this, I, I went ahead and printed out all the percentiles. You can see that um, it starts to get like a little bit off as we go through because this is random numbers. And some of these, you know, this happens to be that 52 values are 46% um, or below. 
in this data set, or sorry, 46% um, of the values are 52 or below. Um, but yeah, so that's the percentile of a, not a normal distribution, just a, it's just a, a distribution from one to 100. Um, then I took a distribution, oh, yes, of y. y here is, again, the normal distribution. And we can see that we're, um, uh, did I do this right? That I made them all, right? I got a, uh, I need to look at y. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, the standard deviation is one. And so um, they are, am I saying this right? You have They're all about 50. Sorry, what? Mean zero standard deviation one. Uh, right. So this doesn't mean 50 standard deviation one. I was trying to get it close to the same data, but no, you're right. I just want to do that. And because the standard deviation is too small to really see it. And let's go ahead and rebuild it. Because, right, we're not looking at the actual values, so it doesn't matter whether they're close to the same numbers. All right. Is it reloaded? All right. Here we go. So if we look at 50%, we're right around somewhere in 50, we're at zero. That's where we cross over. So we can see between 53 and 54%, but most of the data is below zero, or sorry, not half of the data roughly is below zero, half the data is above zero. Um, and you can see that, you know, 100% is uh, below 2.3, because that's what happen to be in our, uh, that's what it is in this particular normal distribution. Um, our lowest value is negative 2.9. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> I was trying to throw that together at the last minute to uh, to show an example. But um, I, I did want to show the difference between like a, um, different qu quantiles. So it, in, in R, there's a quantile function. You tell it what prob probabilities you want to look at. So I set this one up at first just to show actual percentiles all the way through. But you can also just say, OK, I want uh, the quantile by default is the is a quartile. It's the the four, um, or the, the five divisions, but at 25, 50, 75, 100. Um, yep. maybe, maybe for why, if you did the mean at 50 and you did a standard deviation of more like 20. Yeah, that probably. That might, that might be an easier comparison between X and Y. That's probably a good idea. I'll, I'll go ahead and run that. Um, but does anyone have, have any other thoughts about quantiles in general? Um, I would like to try to get a nice, easy to understand example in here. So any other ideas would be good. Um, oops, I didn't hit re-render. Yeah, so um, I intentionally wanted a data set that would be not perfect, Diego. So that's why I went with, like, I, I had it up at 100,000, and then everything is exactly perfect. And it shows, you know, exactly what you would expect. But then it, it's, it almost, it made it hard to understand, okay, so 1% is 1 and 2% is 2. What, you know, it didn't seem like it meant anything. Um, but yeah, the larger sample size, like that is a good point that um, I set this with rules and it almost, you know, it mostly followed them because it's a hundred samples. But if you go up to a hundred thousand samples, it's the the mean and the standard deviation, or sorry, the um, percentiles have an exact meaning at that point or pretty close to an exact meaning because you have a large data set. All right, let's see, that has finished rendering. So in theory... Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll probably switch that out to, oh, one thing to notice is these numbers are slightly different now because it re-rendered and I didn't give it a seed. So it is just random distribution distributions. 
Um, that's funny. So with a standard deviation of 20, um, I did happen to have one that's very low uh, because that can happen with a standard deviation of 20. Um, but most of these come out to about, you know, about what you're looking at. Um, if we plot, and I think Jonathan is exactly right that we probably want to do just um, deciles instead of percentiles. So let's take it down to 10 bins and re render again. Oops. Okay. Reload. All right. So, you know, again, with, with the just sampling from one to 100. Um, they come out pretty close to the values that that there are about 79 that are, or there are 79 values, or sorry, there are 80% of the values are 79 or below um, versus with the uh, slightly more random distribution. It like, it's further away until you get in the middle. And the middle is about at 50 and then it's, uh, you know, different sized bins, if that makes sense. I hope that kind of made sense. All right. Any anyone have any all other this makes To me, this makes more sense when you visualize it with histograms, which I think will come Which, to. that is true. So probably <laughs> we'll want to put those these same examples into the histograms um, when I update the notes. All right. Uh, the other thing I they don't talk about here, um, I can't. I think they introduced it in the box plot section, maybe. Um, just IQR is convenient to put it here because it is uh, this. It's difference between 75 and 25 is the interquartile range. Um, so that's 47.25. And yes, good. I was like, I hope I am not going to have evidence that I'm saying that wrong. But no, this is that is what that is. So it's the difference between the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile is the IQR. Um, it's a nice, so that's that's like 50% um, of your data falls inside of that. And so often that's a nice way to, uh, to just kind of quickly summarize the variability. Any, any other thoughts on this before we move on? All right. Oh. <laughs> All right, now we're going to start getting into visual or yeah, visualizations. Um, I, I put some of the data from their data set in, um, in our repo. Uh, the, and I've got a link um, either above or I don't know, somewhere around here, I've got a link to their, da their data set if you want to look at it. Oh, I think it was up in the... Um, the median and mean section, but anyway, so we can we can download their data. And I did that because I didn't feel like finding one that would make nice plots. But I think I'm going to go back and change this to just use um, our x and y so that we can see the distributions. But all right, so they have this state data set, which is population and murder rate, um, and they did all their plots. Well, actually, they did these plots in base. I, so I went ahead and did them in ggplot just to compare. Um, so you can do a box plot uh, with the geom box plot in ggplot. And what this is showing us is um, like the, you know, this is the middle of our uh, data set or our distribution. Um, it's median in a box plot, right? Can't remember if it's median or mean. Damon. It's yeah, median. It's median. Yeah, I thought it was median. Yeah, and then it's your um, your your percentiles, your uh, first and third quartile, um, and then outliers are also shown on a box plot. The whiskers are, I think that's what I was just looking at. They're like one point five eight times the interquartile range. Um, which is another one of those magic numbers, and I'm not sure exactly why it's 1.58. Um, I think it's no more than that. Like it can be less than that. Okay, yeah. 
anything beyond that is then considered an outlier, I think. Right. Um, oh, sorry, that's the, the 1.58 is for notches. And it's over the square root of n, um, which we don't go into here. Um, but it's 1.5 times the uh, IQR. Um, I like box plots. Uh, they they give you a nice quick view of what's going on. And I like, you know, and the outliers because a lot of times you want to know: um, Are there outliers? How big are the outliers? How how many of them are there roughly? Um, so that can be useful. Um, <clears throat> do you have a question? Have a question. Go for it. Yeah. Um, so what does this whiskers tell us? Um, uh, I can see this other point there, uh, outliers, but I can see whisker here, the one at the top is larger and the one is smaller. So what do they tell us in box plot? Do they have any meaning to the data? Yeah, it's, um, so, 50% of your data is in the box. Most of the rest of your data is in the whiskers. And I can't, again, I can't remember the exact rules on how the whiskers are defined, but it, you know, if you go from here to here, that's gonna cover almost all of your data. And then you've got some outliers that aren't, aren't in there. So this is my understanding and anyone who knows can correct me. <laughs> so, it will draw the whiskers to cover the rest of the data up to a maximum of, what is it, like right. 1.5 times the IQR. And after that, it just draws the, the points for the outliers. That's so, okay, yes, that is correct. So technically, so whiskers, you could have a lot of outliers. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the, this is 1.5 times IQR, um, or rather it's, what is it? It's um, 1.5 times IQR from the median, plus or minus. Um, and cool, we've, uh, so we have a link in the chat for a plot or a, a blog about why 1.5. And then, yeah, the 1.58, which you'll see mentioned in the box plot help, is sometimes you'll see notches drawn in, and you use that to um, put a 95% confidence interval on the median. And again, it's another magic number that comes out of if you run through all the numbers. Um, we'll get there in a minute, Diego. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, yeah, that's so like there's a lot of information encoded in the box plot. You can see like how much of your data is kind of falling outside of the main part of the distribution. You can see where the median is. Again, I think someone mentioned that they're really nice when you're. Um, yeah, Scott mentioned for the section, the next section, or the two sections from now, if you're trying to compare two different distributions, seeing, you know, one down here and then one up here, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, <laughs> I, just don't ruin, like, it's coming. All right. So first, okay, they, they go off into histogram and density when clearly everyone wants to talk about box plots or violin plots when you're talking about box plots. But first, we need to get density. So a histogram is basically you put everything into bins and um, see how much is in each bin. I, again, I did everything in ggplot just to have that next to, uh, you know, so you have the code that they used. You can look at that, but the same-ish sort of thing. I, I stuck with population um, mostly because I didn't want to, like, learn the murder rate column enough to make pretty plots uh, this morning. But anyway, um, so we're looking at that same population thing that's in the box plot. If we look at the histogram, just giving it 10 bins, and then I over plotted with a density plot, um, you can kind of see how the histogram is giving like exact counts of how many are in each of these bins. And the density is using those counts to kind of estimate what's the density at each of these numbers. And there's some in between. Um, does that make sense? And see now I should have done the payoff and done the box plot and density or a box and violin of that same thing. But I had to use, oh, where are, oh it's on the next slide. Um, <laughs> oh, and so yeah, sorry. Then they went and just did categorical data and that was boring, it's bar charts. like. 
bar charts are boring. Um, but they do some things kind of related, you know, categorical with numbers is where things get more interesting. So um, I'm going to skip correlation and come back because um, there are th problems with violin plots, especially with box plots over plotted that this XKCD goes into. Like they're descriptive, but just be aware that sometimes um, it's not the nicest visualization to use. Uh, that is something that comes up um, from time to time that, I, I mean, really the fact that that's doubled doesn't add any of information over it being a density plot. And so there are some plots that just um, over plot just a density with the box plot. Um, it should, yeah, ridgeline plots are great for just density, but they then you don't have the like overplotting ridgeline and box plot is what I'd like to see more of. Um, but yeah, so there are uh, some, and, and there's there's rain dot drop plots. I I want to see does um, is this okay? Yeah, that's actually that's really that's cool. pretty neat. That's, yeah. yeah, I thought there was another one. Oh yeah, Cedric. Um, yeah, there we go. So there's box plot, density plot, and the um, raindrops. Um, the so technically the raindrop plot would be this rotated because the idea is that the actual data is coming out of the cloud of the density plot. Um, but that that basically is the idea. Uh, um, all of these, like, yeah, they don't go into it in the book, but there are a bazillion ways to visualize. That's what Tidy Tuesday is to, for learning about. So you can go on Twitter and search for the hashtag Tidy Tuesday, brought to you by the R4DS online learning community, um, and see all kinds of cool plots. Um, and Cedric here, who, who this tweet is from, um, has a whole bunch of uh, 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 like tutorials and things. He's he does really great visualizations. Um, all right. So and yes, anything but dynamite plots. Um, now, to be fair, you know sometimes this is the quick and easy thing to do, and it's um, these take some information in order to be able to interpret them versus most most everyone can interpret these so i understand hating dynamite plots but they do have a purpose in um depending who you're working with and who your audience is but anyway that's i mean like in this yeah. particular example the shrek one there's actually a case to be made for the dynamite because like the volume of that bar is relevant because it's the, like the the earnings of the movie Right, and that's that's the that's the visual difference here. Like it, like the size of that green space means something versus the size of the blue space. Yeah, ish, <laughs> ish. Yeah. Um. Actually, yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Like this, um, like the the this is telling you everything about the data, pretty much. Like the the box plot and the density plot and the raindrops you're like you see number one like you know shrek quadru quadrilogy it's only four movies and it's hard to other than knowing the word quadrilogy you don't see that here but here it's, it's four data points versus there's a whole bunch of data points um <laughs> um i don't know like, uh, my understanding is MAD is one of those things that hasn't uh, made it out of stats as much. Like, statisticians use MAD, and some places you see it, other places. But I don't, I don't see MAD nearly as much as Saren Deviation, for sure. And, you know, you, I learned Saren Deviation in, um, like, many classes, uh, many science classes. I don't think I learned MAD outside of a stats context. Is it newer? It can't be. I mean, it's not that complicated, so I don't know. I think standard deviation has some nice properties that 
like for certain calculations and stuff. I don't, I can't get into, I don't, I don't know enough to say more, but <laughs> it has some things that are nice about it. Oh, oh, right. It's a uh, standard deviation is easier. Um, you need to sort your data to calculate MAD and um, you couldn't do that as easily 40 years ago as you can now. And if, you know, if you've got a trillion data points, it's still kind of hard to sort. Um, so I think that it's one of those that has grown with computation that it's more possible to calculate it now than it was at one time. Um, and then beyond that, I would love to, uh, you know, if people have thoughts, bringing that up in the Slack could be something that gets more, more ideas. All right, where was I? <laughs> oh, correlation. Um, I skipped over that part. Um, correlation is um, the relationship between two variables. Um, <laughs> oh, I thought I oh, I didn't put in the the extra thing to make it shut up. Um, again, I took what they did. I mean, I still use read CSV. But I, I took their code, which is available again on their GitHub for dealing or and also their within the book, they had some of this. I just rewrote this little ETFs thing into uh, dplyr so I could understand what it was doing because I am not it, it, it is hard for me to read the bracket notation selections. And so um, they have these two data frames. One is um, all of, all of the S&P 500 prices by date, and each column is a uh, ticker symbol, each row is a date. Um, and then they have another one that is all the ticker symbols and it has things like what sector is it in? So we're taking the ticker symbols that are in the ETF sector and just pulling out the symbol. And those are the columns that we want out of the S&P 500. And then we're gonna correlate all of those. All right, and then core plate, core plot is taking the correlation between those ETFs with these ellipses, ellipses and um, yeah. And so you come up with this and it's showing um, how much each one of them correlates to one another, um, except to itself. That's, so the diagonal is the self-correlation, which is one-to-one -one by definition. And then the, um, the ovals are showing, you know, positive correlations, negative correlations. Some of these are, you know, the, the um, darkness is how strong the correlation is. Um, this is, a, you know, a nice quick way to visualize uh, whether things are related to one another. So I, I think this was good to go into. Does anyone have any, any thoughts on it? John, what does the size of the ovals represent? Like, is that representative of anything? The the skinnier the oval, the stronger the correlation. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I think that's all that's saying. So a circle is basically, they're not correlated. And here it's also lighter when it's a circle, so you can barely yeah. see. Yeah, so like these are like not correlated at all. Um, Versus that's, so it was a lot of times something like this will just um, like put an X or something or an NA or, you know, whatever. It'll just leave out the self-correlation, but that the self-correlation kind of acts as a key because you can see it's a dark skinny line. Um, I don't know why there is noise in it. Um, that part I'm not sure about because it is itself, so it is correlated to itself. Um, could be something in the calculation, I guess. Oops. Any other? Um, my guess is that it was trying to draw very, very skinny ellipses. That, yeah. 
I think you're right. And so I think it is like that noise is just like noise. It's like pixel noise because um, it's the same as the anti-aliasing on the actual um, ovals, I think. Um, and that was the chapter. That's that. That was pretty much everything. Uh, anyone have any other thoughts on uh, what was in there? It was a little bit of a like a fire hose of this info. So if you aren't really familiar with mean and standard deviation and median, and you know some of this stuff was new to me, some of it wasn't. Um, so. You know, <laughs> if that if that really hits you hard, let me know. And um, we will see. So Jonathan is going to present next week. Um, and we'll see how that one goes as far as how much of his time it eats up to try to um, put together. And we'll kind of start deciding from there if we're going to keep doing a chapter a week. Because these are long chapters, but so far not dense chapters. Um, yeah, anyone have anything else to say? Any other questions? There are no stupid questions. Try to see if anyone's saying anything. Okay. All right, so, so we, oh. I was Thanks. gonna ask something that comes up again and again is, is like, say for example, you had like a survey where one is, kind of you're asked to pick a number between one and five or in the situation i'm thinking of it was like categorization of the um, uh, extent of disease like one being low level disease and five being extreme disease but i've seen people take a mean of that and that feels wrong but i don't know any better so what's the feelings on that it feels wrong to me too yeah um this would be another one where if anyone has an exact answer, I would love to hear it. I, I have heard, you know, don't average a Likert scale, for example. That's the, you know, how, how much do you agree from, you know, one to five or whatever. And if you've, if half of your sample hates a thing and half of your sample loves a thing, that doesn't mean that your sample is neutral to that thing. So, <laughs> um, so I agree. Like, I think it probably depends on context um but yeah it, it like yeah it's bimodal not neutral and so your example of you know like how much pain do you feel none or a lot and if all your values are either none or a lot averaging that is definitely hiding information um you know that's kind of what could have happened in this sort of data where um let's see you know let's say you know one of these had been down here but we wouldn't see that in the combined data so it's the same kind of thing with that that if you average scales that aren't where each value has meaning then you are losing i mean i also think like you shouldn't average things if it doesn't make sense to add them Yes, you know, averaging involves adding. And yeah, yeah. Sense to, like I mean, that's maybe that doesn't always work, but as a, <laughs> as a general rule of thumb. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, that your distance between one and two, and three and four in something like Likert or this pain scale, the distance isn't an absolute value, and so averaging them implies that the distance is an absolute thing. Like, oh, if I have two pain level one that's the same as a pain level two yeah it's not necessarily um so yeah the adding kind of works there too um so what do you what do you do instead <laughs> uh distribution of like you know like stick to things that are showing the distributions um i mean it depends on the context for sure like we definitely you know lots of people will have um, some score like that of like how much did you like this thing or whatever and oh we're trying to increase that score really you're trying to increase you know increase the things that are in the last box or 
decrease the things that are in the last box. The the count in the last box. Count, you know, move that distribution. Um, yeah, and I, I'll bet we'll go into some things with that at some point. If not in this book, then we'll keep going <laughs> in in the Slack. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Scott's around to have a wait on this. Sorry, I had to step away for a minute yeah. and miss much of the discussion. <laughs> so we were we're talking about um, like pseudo numeric data, and you know, like you've got like a Likert scale, and um, it in a lot of cases you shouldn't average something like that. What should you do instead? <laughs> yeah. So there are other methods that are built for what you might consider um, ordinal or interval data, depending which it is. And yeah, averaging is not the right answer. <laughs> um, let me think. I'm trying to think <laughs> what the right... Yeah. There are other methods. Give me a second on that one. <laughs> no problem. Sorry, my mind is... <laughs> Well, I don't in like six different directions this this week. By the way, I'm in the middle of a I'm in the middle of a career change from academia to industry within the next month or so, and it's just oh. been a it's been a zoo. Well, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry. It's just I, I'm trying to take advantage of you being here. And yes, congrats. Um, but, or Thanks, I hope congrats. I think. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, I, I hope we get into this more too. If not, it might be something to just start a discussion about on the Slack and see what we see either within this channel or in the stats, the help stats channel. Um, yeah, it depends. It depends on the situation, I think. Um, but it'll be interesting to see uh, if we get into that. Cause I, I, I see that a lot. Um, Jonathan and I both see where we have lots of things that are just a like a, a scale of how much do you like this thing and a lot of our product people have a tendency to want to say oh they liked it 3.2 on average it's like but that's not that, that doesn't mean anything you know so um yeah <laughs> agree and a half I like that so, um, yeah, it, it does, it depends. Like, uh, you know, a lot of times if you're doing something like that, like you really want to look at the bins and then think about what matters to you in the bins. Um, again, if we've got a bunch of fives and a bunch of ones, maybe our goal is to get rid of those ones, to move those ones up to twos or threes. Um, maybe our goal well, that's probably <laughs> mostly our goal if it's a like kind of scale. Um, but you're not trying, you're not like, oh, it's a three, so let's move those threes up to a four. It's like, no, let's get rid of the thing that's making them crazy, that making making a, uh, making them hate us. Yeah. Um, we didn't go into that at all. A geometric mean Jim brought up in the chat. Um, that there are places where that makes more sense. Doesn't know if it's <laughs> adding anything here, but um, oh, and then the HH package is linked in the in the chat as a way to visualize Likert scales. All right. Yeah, we've got some good stuff in the chat about this, so um, I will be posting that very shortly into the channel if you don't make it through. Uh, right now, through all the links. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah, next week um, we will be looking at the the next chapter, which is data and sampling distributions. Um, and actually, I think we do go a little bit. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, anyway, I haven't read the chapter yet. Uh, Jonathan will present it. Be thinking about chapter three. If you would be interested in talking about statistical experiments and significance 
testing because we will need somebody. And that's oh, that's that's a that's a meaty chapter. That one we might end up splitting. We'll have to see what that ends up as because that sounds like it's the chapter on stats. <laughs> so um, it'd be interesting to see. All right, I'll see you all on the uh, Slack. All right. Thanks, John. All right. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.